enjoy what they are doing. They, they should enjoy going to school. They should enjoy meeting their teachers. They should enjoy the various activities in the classroom. Technology should also personalize education. What that means is that it should be based on the learner's needs. If I can't complete a 300 hours course, there should be room given to me to extend that course and do it at my own pace. It should be student paced, not teacher paced, you know? And technology should also enforce or promote collaborative approach. Someone said, the students love group work, like one of the outcomes the, the teacher wants to achieve is the students working in groups. That's collaborative approach. And you can use technology to bridge that gap between the high learners and the you know, average learners and the struggling learners as well. So it's a collaborative approach. And the most important for me as an administrator and as an educator is that technology should be able to measure learning through analytics. You should be able to measure learning through analytics. What does that mean? You should be able to track your students' performance. It's not, it should not just be about, um, I'm giving them a test, I'm giving them an exam. Okay, we wait for when school resumes. No, how did they perform? What are the analytics? Who scored the highest? What is the average performance? How can we help children below average? And you can only get this at the tip of your fingers when you analyze their results. And not just at the end of the term, even in for formative assessments, when the students are going on with their formative assessments, you should be able to analyze their work and track their performance as well. And then you would know as a school where you need to um, um, meet with the needs of the students. Is my school lagging behind in mathematics? Are we lagging behind in sciences? What do we need to do to boost the academic performance of these students. Now, I came up with five tips on how educators can maximize technology with the sole aim of improving learning outcomes. Remember, when there is no positive results in teaching and learning, then we've just wasted our time and energy because we've not been able to meet or bridge that gap between the learner and the objectives of the lesson. So what are those five tips? They are all intertwined actually, but I'll be focusing on the first tip for the sake of this um, session. The first tip is to reconstruct teaching methods. I was watching a text video, which I'll be sharing with us by the end of this um, session. And there was one statement made by the speaker that struck me. He said that teachers, So there was one statement he made that struck me. He said that what a lot of schools or educators are doing or what ed tech tools are doing is that they just give out um, a tool for teachers to use and all that. So you see a school, you have a smart board, you have, um, what's it called? You have Microsoft Teams, you have all those things, LMS and the rest of them. However, what we are just doing is to transfer the traditional content into digital. That's what we are doing. The teaching methods have not changed. What we are just doing with technology in our world is to transfer that same textbook that we used in secondary school, just digitize it. Okay, ah, they want digital. Be Okay, let's turn the economics textbook into online textbook, and then they read the same content right? But we've not thought of how we can reconstruct teaching methods. So that's the first thing that is the most important right now and that we'll be focusing on throughout the session. Other things that we need to do is to teach outside the classroom. The world is a global village, you know. You can be in Nigeria and you're working for a company in UK or a company in, in, in America. For example, I do a lot of activities for international organizations and I'm in Nigeria right here and I'm making my money, you know, without even traveling to UK or Canada. So how do we help these students to get to that point by teaching outside the classroom? That is another point to consider. Then assessing students' learning. How do you assess students' learning? Okay, using technology. 
that's formative assessment. I think I've explained that in the last slide. And then we also need to get to the point where we should say yes to technology. Enough of the, oh, it's going to hurt the children. They will go into something else. No, you need to find a balance. You need to create the protective mechanisms to protect these children from negative content. Because if you keep shielding them from technology, they will still embrace it on their own. They are born into the tech world, so they will still embrace it. And trust me, they will feel towards the negative angle. But if we as teachers are the first set of people to introduce them to technology, then they will see the productiveness of using technology and not tilting towards the negative angle of technology. And of course, finally, reverse the learning model. Reversing the learning model means that you cannot keep being the teacher or the boss in the classroom. You need to take a step back and let the students lead their learning. Difficult, right? It takes a lot of class control. It takes a lot of classroom management and all that. But we need to get to the point where we become facilitators and not teachers, not just standing in the classroom and teaching and teaching and teaching and talking for hours. And then you get your learners will just get tired. Your learners should be part of the learning process. They should be in charge. It should be students led learning and student centered learning. So these are the five tips I have. I don't know if we have more tips you can share with us by the end of this session. So the major thing I want us to focus on is reconstruct teaching methods. Reconstructing teaching methods. That is what I would like us to focus on. I don't know if you can still hear me and if you, you're still following the class. Can I just hear a yes I am or a chat to show that you're following the class and you are I'm not too fast in my explanation. Okay, can we still hear me? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to go on now. So this is the major focus of this um, session, reconstructing teaching methods. Um, let's look at the various ways of reconstructing teaching methods. Reconstructing teaching method is basically switching teaching methods while enhancing learning using technology. And there are four areas I'd like us to focus on. The first one is flipped learning. I know some of us have heard about flipped learning. And then there's micro learning, blended learning, and mastery learning. I had to do a lot of research um, about these various methods. And I'm so glad I'll be sharing some of my findings with you. So let's walk along. I'll start with flipped learning. Now, I want you to think about this scenario because I know some of you are already doing it, but you don't know that you're flipping your class already. Now, Ms. Ayamu wants to teach the summary of Romeo and Juliet in her literature class. And then she stumbles upon a movie online about Romeo and Juliet. She downloads the child appropriate version and shares with her class on their LMS platform. LMS means learning management system, okay? There are so many of them that we already know about um, for them to watch over the weekend. Then in her next class, the students are allowed to discuss the movie and write a detailed summary of the story. What Ms. Ayanu has done is that she has just used technology to flip her classroom. So she did not introduce the concept to them. She gave them an activity to do at home, watch a video. And they would enjoy it. The students will enjoy it. Oh, a movie. Wow, fantastic. And then in the next class, all they are doing is just to discuss the video. Oh, what did you learn from the video? Can someone come out and tell us about what happened in the video? Who are the characters in the video? She's not, she's not teaching them again. Like, oh, this is William Shakespeare. Romeo and Juliet said this, da, 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 and talking long stories. No. Do you understand? So in that class, Ms. Ayan will take the back seat. She will no longer be the teacher teaching. Before you know what is happening, collaboration is happening because she can break students in groups and they will discuss the various aspects of the video. And then at the end, she just tell them to write a summary. And trust me, the students will be ready to bring out um, various summaries. Now her emphasis and her focus will now be on how they are writing their summary. She will now have more time to correct them, to correct errors, grammatical errors, punctuation errors, you know, and you know, and help guide them in the presentation of their work. Rather than use 30 minutes to talk and talk and talk and talk, 
and then the students are just listening with a bored expression. So that is what flipped classroom is basically. So I want you to think of, I'm going to, I'm coming back to my wonderful teachers. I want you to give me an instance using any topic of your choice of how you can apply flipped learning. I'll give us two minutes to do this. Think of any topic of your choice and tell me how you can apply flipped learning with that topic. You can type your response in the chat box, just two minutes, and then I move to the next slide. Okay, someone says, if I am to teach addition in the classroom to prepare the kids for the topic, I can send them a YouTube video on addition. Okay, thank you. So that's fair enough. That's, that's a infusing technology through sounds and audio. But let's think of how we can infuse technology apart from videos. What else can you do? I want us to think out of the box. I know I gave an instance of video and all that, but what else can you do um, without video? You know, there's other tech activities you can give them without videos before they come into your classroom to discuss the topic. Okay, a lot of us are giving instances of video. Video is not the only form of technology. You know, you could, you could give them a research topic. You could give them a link to go and make a research online and then they come back. For example, you're teaching them um, history, maybe the history of, um, of Egypt, you can, you, about the Egyptian pyramid, for example. You could, you could tell them to go to um, um, National Geographic and then they could just study the dimensions of the Egyptian pyramid as it is now. You know, that, that's also flipped learning. It mustn't necessarily always be um, video based. It can be a research, it can be a VR. VR is virtual reality. It can be, it can even be a podcast, you know, anything that is technology based that they can interact with before they come into the classroom is when you can use flipped learning. But thank you very much for all your suggestions and your answers. Thank you for following me in this class. So I'll go on to the next slide. How do you flip a class? We're still on flipped learning. First of all, you need to buy in. You need to buy in. You need to, um, from the very first day of your class, you need to ensure that your students understand your style of flipped learning. I, you need to like, prepare their minds that, okay, this term for every topic, I'm going to give a particular activity to do before you come in for the topic, before you come in to do the topic. So maybe on Fridays, the homework for Fridays should not be based on um, a long top assignment activity on everything they've done during the week. It can be a mixture of both, maybe two assignments based on what they've done during the week, and then two other assignments based on what they'll be doing for the next week that will be fun and engaging for them. So that's the first thing. Then you need to curate resources. You need to ask yourself, what kind of resources am I going to be exposing these children to? What kind of content will I be exposing the students to? Is it video content? Is it going to be National Geographic? Is it going to be an encyclopedia like Britannica and um, you know, Encanta? 
Am I going to expose them to games? Am I going to expose them to watching the news? Watching the news can be flipped learning. Can tell them to watch the news about something. Maybe you're teaching them about um, World War II and you want them to watch the news about the reports between Russia and Ukraine. That's flipped learning as well. So it depends on the resource material you would like them to use. And then classroom management, very, very important. Now, you need to also create rules for the students to follow so that they, and to ensure that they are doing those activities you want them to do. Because if none of them watches the video that you want them to learn from, or they read the material you want them to read before they come to the class, then that class is defeated. The objective of the lesson is defeated because there's nothing to teach at that point, right? So you need to follow up with the students. If possible, add certain trackers or reward system to those who follow the flipped learning, right? Then you also need to train them. You want a child to do something on flip grid and the child has never used flip grid in their lives. You understand, you need to train them. You want a child to go to Padlet and work on something on Padlet and the child has never used Padlet. That, that loses the whole intention. Or you want a child to do something on Nearpod or to even use the Edvest portal to do something and they are not trained on how to use it, then you've missed the entire point. So you need to train your students. For me, as a teacher, I'll share my experience. What I do is that I don't allow the students to use different um, platforms at the same time. You understand? I can tell myself that, okay, throughout this term, I'll be using only Padlet and YouTube. Padlet and YouTube. So I would have trained the first few weeks of school. Maybe school resumes that first week. I would train them on how to use Padlet. Or then I can say, okay, the next, the next term, okay, I'm going to train my students on how to use study ladder. So that first week, I would have trained them on how to use study ladder so that when I give them activities to do, they're already used to, this, to, the, to the product or to the tech tool. And then you don't have parents calling you over the weekend. I don't know where to press, so where should I press? Where should I go? You know, the students already know how to use. You can also teach your parents. You can do um, a screencast video teaching them where to go to, how to operate that particular tool, especially for younger children, how to operate the particular tool, and then send to their parents to watch and learn. And then when you give them activities on that, using that tool, the parents already know how to use it. In my daughter's school over the weekend, they, they did a podcast for us to learn how to use Flipgrid. I already know how to use Flipgrid, so I didn't have to watch that podcast, but they did it and it was so beautifully illustrated. And that was how a lot of parents were able to learn. And the next day, that was on Monday, um, on sorry, on Wednesday, after the public holiday, they gave them an assignment on Flipgrid and none of us struggled to do it. So training your parents and training your, your children on the use of any tool you want to bring into the classroom is very, very important. And then you need to also consider how you want to assign content for homework. And remember, when they are done, the student, it should be all about the students. You should ensure that the students work the problems out in the class. Like I gave you an example. After watching the Romeo and Juliet movie, they come back into the class and they work on their own. They work in groups to answer certain problems and certain questions on the, on, on, on the, on the lesson. And remember, you should have to ensure that it is independent learning. By the time you do a lot of flipped classroom or you, 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 you take the style of flipping your class all the time, you will raise more independent learners. Remember one of us said her learning outcome is for her students to be independent. So you will raise more independent learners if you use flipped classroom a lot. So um, let's go on. Now, I want us to look at this curve. Let's look at this curve. What does this curve tell you about how children learn? You can type in your chat box, or if you want to speak, I will allow you to speak. I think I'm talking too much. Okay, so what does this curve tell you about how children learn? If you'd like to speak, you can put up your hand, or you can type in the chat.
Okay, I'll give us one minute more. Okay, someone wants to speak. I'll allow Maruf to speak. All right, let's go on, Maruf. I think, uh, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I think the, it is talking, I mean, talking about the learner's uh, retentive uh, habit that uh, when you engage them immediately, you engage them, they may get 100% of what you are telling them. But immediately after some minutes, hours, days, you will realize that uh, they will have uh, missed out on what you, you, you've taught them. So exactly. to me, I think that's what he's uh, talking about, that um, the more the immediately you engage them, they will get to know most of those things. But as the maybe over an hour, two hours, three hours, the more they are moving away from that, uh, what you dish out to them, the more they forget most of those uh, information. Thank you very much, Maru. Thank you. Now, you know, this, is not, this doesn't just happen to children alone. It happens to us adults. Can anybody remember all the things they learned in the university? Can you remember all your courses? Like you can list all the courses you learned from year one to final year. Let's be honest with ourselves. See, many of us can remember. I cannot remember everything I learned in the university so many years ago. So if we as adults can forget, what rights do we have to blame the students when they forget? That's why you see a child who is in year six who say, oh, I can't remember Roman numerals again. That I learned in primary three. I can't remember how to write a diary. You understand? It's no fault of theirs. This is research that has been done on how the brain accumulates knowledge. So the brain gets taps in, is like a photograph, it taps in knowledge, and then it goes to store the knowledge in a memory valve in your brain, right? And you just know that I've heard about this thing before, but it will take you a lot more, maybe promptings, maybe um, um, things that can spark your memory for you to bring out that knowledge again, you know? So that brings us to the next thing. If we know that this is how children learn, why are we jam packing work for the children? Why are we jam packing lessons for the children? And that brings us to the next thing that we need to change. We need to delve into micro learning. I've talked about flipped learning, which we can use technology to do. And now I'm going into micro learning. What is micro learning? Micro learning is a method of learning via short, bit sized, and well planned units that the students consume via digital media. So, what it means is that you are breaking down learning into short, manageable pieces of information. You're not jam packing them with so much, you're breaking it down. And how do you break it down? Let me give you a typical example of one of my lessons. So, I I was teaching them something about the, that was like four years ago, about the history of um, Britain when it comes to the House of Tudors, right? That was the topic, the Tudors. And it was a lot of knowledge, right? They have to cram the timeline. They have to think about what happened and all that. So I had to break it down. And in breaking it down, the first thing I did was to, you know, expose them to a redo. Right, they started with a redo, and then after the redo, from there, from doing the redo, they were able to. I was able to introduce them to each of the characters that I will be talking about in that historical class. Then I moved into the next thing. The next thing was for them to watch a video. Right, I showed them a song which they learned. Now, can you see? I'm breaking it in bits and bits. This was a 40 minutes class, by the way. Then after that, after learning the song, just from the song, they were able to know what happened to each wife of Henry the Eighth, or oh, sorry, Henry the Seventh. Yeah, right. And then we moved on to learning the exact contents, what happened, how did the story go. Then the last part was for them to master the timeline of events of the Tudor house. Now breaking the, the information into big size learning using technology, I use various aspects of technology. First thing I used was a puzzle, an online puzzle using Redos. The second thing I used was a video where they had to learn how to sing and rap 
about the, 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 the topic. And then the next thing I used was, you know, my PowerPoint presentation talking about the content of the lesson and everything. And then at the end, they did a quiz game, right? So now breaking those things into bit size, we're working online at that point. I, after teaching them in class using all these bit size methods, I transferred those bit size methods to their online platform. So for that week, we had the two doors, right? Under the two doors, unit one, they do the redo, unit two. So even a child who misses that lesson and goes back to the online platform, to the LMS platform, will see the arrangements of work. I call it workflow. We'll see the arrangements of work and follow that workflow pattern to learn. So even after teaching that child, the child can still go back. I love technology so much because it's a store of knowledge. The child can still go back to that platform, right? And follow the workflow process to still remember that topic. That's what micro learning is about. Not jump packing knowledge and talk and talk and talk. And then at the end of the day, you give them long notes to copy. I think we should change that teachers. Don't you think so? We need to start changing the narrative of how children experience learning in the classroom. Trust me, when children do activities using the bite-sized method that you've given them, they don't forget easily. It will be stuck to them. Do you know that during the exam, it was, it's a funny experience, but during the exam, some children were singing to answer questions. The examiner came to me, why are your children singing? I said, I don't know, what are they singing? And she told me they are singing something about um, um, Divorce Beheaded Died. Divorce, but it's, a, it's a rap song, Divorce Beheaded Died. I said, oh, that's the Tudo. And they were singing that song to remember the topic. You understand? So, but if I had not broken it down and I just said, oh, today we are learning about Tudos and I start talking and talking and talking, I haven't achieved the learning outcome at that point. I can beat my chest and say for a fact that no child ever fails when I use this method for them because you're breaking it down bit by bit for them to understand. Now, how does it benefit your classroom? It maintains attention span. For example, as I'm talking and talking, some of you are already doing something else. <laughs> Let's not lie. Because when you talk too much as an educator, you lose the interest of your learners. In fact, research has shown that children who are below five years, after five minutes of talking, they are not listening to you anymore. When, it, when they get to six to 10 years, after 15 minutes of talking, they're not listening to you anymore. And adults, after 30 minutes of talking, they're not listening to you anymore. So it's very important for you to learn how to utilize this research work to break down instruction into smaller pieces so that you can maintain the attention span of your students. Also, it ensures that students own their learning pace. So it's like I told you, a student can still go back to the stored work the third workflow and learn at their own learning pace and it saves time and energy in that class i didn't have to talk in fact i'm talking too much in this class i'm not used to talking too much because i love breaking down lessons in, a, in an easy way and i just sit back and observe and sitting back and observe as a teacher gives you the opportunity to notice when a child is not getting it right and then you can now focus on that learner to help that learner you know meet up with the pace of other students and remember, each unit should be tied to the learning objective of the lesson. You have to make it interactive and you don't have to overwhelm your students. Breaking it down in chunk sizes does not mean that there will be an activity. No, you could just have only two activities in that lesson or three activities, but you've broken down the lesson to suit each of those activities based on the objective of the lesson. So um, I know we, we, we understand everything I'm saying. Okay, so because of time, I would um, quickly um, round up. I hope I will have an opportunity to speak to us again. When should we not use micro learning? When you're learning a skill like musical instruments, instructional design, software to teamwork skills, sales, it's not really adequate to use micro learning because you are learning a skill and you can't break down those things in chunks. No. It's something that is like you're practicing how to play piano. You can't say, okay, after five minutes, do this. No. Micro learning though, is not needed when you're learning complex skills. It's needed when you're learning, um, when you're receiving information about something, not learning a skill. Because learning a skill, you have to do and do and do. You know, so let's take note of that. And the famous one that everybody is talking about right now is blended learning. I'm moving on to blended learning. This picture alone 
tells, tells you what blended learning is about. It's face to, the blend of face-to-face -face interaction and technology, right? Traditional method and technology, flexible schedule, remote learning, adaptive learning tools, and personalization. So why should we blend our classroom? Blending your classroom gives you um, the opportunity to address students' needs better and quicker. It also gives you the opportunity to differentiate lessons. And it also gives you first-hand information on how to track your students through data and knowledge. So when you have the data of your students' work, you can now make a decision, okay, I can't move to the next topic. I, I, I need to repeat this topic because these students have shown me that they're not getting it right, right? So blended learning is very, very important. It's a broad topic. I'm not going to talk about it in this class, but if you need help with how to understand blended learning or how to infuse it in your classroom, I'd like you to go on YouTube and watch our last webinar on Edverse, where we really um, um, talked about this um, style of teaching, blended learning, and then you can watch the webinar. Um, so I brought up a scientific study that was conducted in um, natural bio biotech tech biotechnology of the Institute of Massachusetts um, in 2014. And they saw that um, how learning impacts using laboratory simulations, right? Simulations are also good softwares that you can use to teach students um, how to go into the field and do particular career, particular experiments. It's particularly good for engineering students and um, science students as well. So using traditional teaching, you can see that it's the lowest. The impact was very low. Then Labstar is the name of the tech tool. When they used only Labstar, there was a great um, peak. But when they combined traditional teaching and Labstar at the same time, it was at the peak, right? So it shows that we cannot just throw away our traditional method. We still need to infuse a bit of it, right? We still need to have that face-to-face -face interaction. We still need to Im imbibe a bit of social and emotional learning into the classroom while we are still exposing the students to technology at the same time. And that brings me to the last um, tool for restructuring your class. Mastery learning. So what is mastery learning? Like the name implies, you have to master a topic before you move to the next one. But is that, it sounds logical, isn't it? Yes, but is that applicable? Are we actually doing it in our classrooms? I want us to respond via the chat. Are we actually, do we, can we beat our chest and say, oh, I, 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 I actually allow my students to master a concept before I move to the next topic? Somebody says no way. <laughs> There's no way because we're so we're so we're so crazy about finishing the curriculum. I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I did a little research two years ago and I asked a lot of adults the what you learned in primary, secondary, and university, how many percentage, what percentage of what you learned are you currently using in your life? And many people said 20%, 30%. Only few said 50, 60, you know. And I've come to realize that we want the children, we bring up beautiful curricula, you know, long processes, so many topics. You see a child learning math, a primary three child, and they have like 14 topics in a term. What, how do you want them to gain mastery of those topics? It just doesn't make sense to me, you know, and I think we need to all sit down as educators and ask ourselves questions. The curriculum that we claim to be using, whether British or Nigerian or American, is it actually helping the students gain mastery? Or are they just moving, like moving from one thing to the other? Nobody is asking, oh, this, this, my, my children scored below 15. That means I can't move to the next topic. As a teacher, I was very stubborn. If my children are not gaining mastery of that topic, I will go to my supervisor and say, excuse me, I am not moving to the next topic until they gain mastery because foundation is very, very important. And technology helps us a lot to gain mastery of concepts. You understand? If we are able to, just like the example I gave you of my students going back to watch, the follow the workflow process of the two dots. If we are able to all tell ourselves the truth as educators and take technology seriously, your students will gain more mastery. Your students will gain more mastery and we'll pull ourselves out 
of that race of completing the curriculum seriously. So that should be another thing that we should change as educators. Now, what are the benefits of mastery learning? Students can finally master concepts while building a growth mindset, grit and perseverance. You have made, if it requires them staying back in school on some days, please do. It's our job, but you should be passionate about it. If it requires you giving them extra time, you know, of course it's not always easy, but let's, let's try it so that the students can even see the perseverance in us and model it, okay? And then the classroom has to change. Students don't have to focus anymore on the lecture. They can now interact with each other, okay? Peer teaching, you can apply peer teaching, you can apply students to content mastery where the student is engaging and interacting with the content. That is why I'm very particular about how teachers develop content. It's not just about I've written my lesson plan. It's not just about I have a PowerPoint. How is the PowerPoint interactive? Is it an interactive PowerPoint or it just shows picture and um, words? Or is it interactive? Does it have different activities for the students to do at each point that can help them gain deeper mastery over the material and not just reading and reading and reading? You know, so let's also think about that. So this is the video I wanted us to watch. Um, I'm so glad I was able to finish within um, <laughs> within 40 minutes or 40, 47 minutes. Okay, I hope I wasn't too fast and I hope I wasn't rushing. I'm going to share the link of this video right now in our chat box so that we can on our own we can click on it. Let it just be in your computer and then you watch the video. Very interesting. Um, concepts. I love guys who think out of the box, and I'm sure you would enjoy this TEDx talk about what technology should be doing in our classrooms and not what it should not be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Remember, finally, teachers play a vital role in technology adoption. So are you ready to collaborate and join hands together to improve your students' learning using technology? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Sokore. Thank you for this short and insightful session. And I believe the, the teachers have also, they, they gained a lot from your session today. So before we give room for questions, so we'll, be giving in a, we'll be giving a short time, maybe five minutes, we'll be giving opportunity for the for participants to ask questions. I would like you, all the participants, Participants right here to please say thank you to Mr. Okore. Okore, sorry, I'm pronouncing it wrongly. <laughs> Can we just say thank you to our <laughs> facilitator? And then if you have questions to ask, you can either unmute yourself or type your question on the chat box and she'll quickly respond to it. We have a few minutes to go. So any question you can indicate by raising up your hand or you type a question directly on the chat box. Okay, Ms. Ahoy, I can see your hand. I, um, let's see if others will also indicate. Okay, so I'll be giving the floor to Ms. Ahoy now. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Why we go through, I'll just be going through the chat box to see if there are other questions there to respond to. Thank you. Hello, Ma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I don't uh, actually have a question. Okay. Yes, so you know, I I don't actually have a question, but I actually wanted to appreciate um a point you made under the micro learning that we don't have to pack the pupils with too much. Particularly, I'm someone that. If, and that's why I really appreciate you. You, were, you. you went straight to the point. You didn't pack too much in your lecture. Because I'm someone that I remember my days in school. If you tell me that 
this class is supposed to be for one hour and mm -hmm. you are doing overtime. I'm someone that I lose interest and I see children in that contest. But mm -hmm. people, I, yes, I see, I also see children in that contest. Well, I see a lot of people make the mistake and parents give us that problem. They want us to pack children. I don't believe in that. And that's why I really want to appreciate that um, point that you made on that micro learning. And I wish everyone can follow that point and we'll see that children will give us a better result. Because in my opinion, a lot of us are packing children, packing children with too many things that they don't need at that point. And these children are not able to balance it out. So I appreciate that point you made, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think Adenike's hands are up. Um, I don't know if anyone is also reading the chat. I can see some questions, but I'll allow Adenike to uh, speak up. And then I don't know if someone can help us with the questions on the chat. Um, good afternoon, um, Mrs. Okoye, if I'm right. Okoye. <laughs> Okoye, sorry. All right, thanks so very much for the uh, for the lecture. Although I joined in late, I, I I think I missed one or two, but this is what I meant in the course of your explanation and all that. Okay, how we can actually make technology more effective in our classes and all that. So um, my question is this: What can we actually do regarding these children, whereby they are having challenges? It's okay. like more like it's more like it's impossible. Like the breakthrough is impossible. You know, they've been battling since their um their how will I put it, their lower primary level, even down to the upper primary level, talk about the grade four, the grade five and six. That's but now what kind of um technology um aspects or Angle, can we can actually give a very a very transforming result on this on this kind of children? Okay, so, yes, so far. To. Okay, no, continue, continue. All right, because so far, ma. Okay, talk, talking about or probably okay, yes, talking about the the normal physical way we teach in class to help them with this blending of sounds and all that. It's not really it's not giving our results as it should be. You know, a child of like nine years old still having issues to get some words, talk less um, math thinking, calculations and all that. It's not really giving them um, what's it called the result. And of course we know that, okay, there are children of, their, um, of different ways of learning, the visual ones, the, of course, the uh, data and all that. So I don't know which aspect of the technology actually can really help like to be a transformation to the core. That was actually okay. my first question. Then secondly, please, I already dropped this in the chat box. I don't know if we can have a video of this session, okay, please. I, I, don't I really want then. to listen from the beginning, from the beginning, because I missed yeah. out. Okay, I, I think I'll leave that to the organizers to um, respond to, but I, I, I would like to respond to your first question. Um, um, I, I don't think, I, don't, I never say it's impossible to teach a child. Every child is intelligent. I'm talking from experience. I have worked with children who are autistic. I have worked with children who have speech problems. I've worked with children who um, have dyslexia. I've worked with children who are even disabled at a different spectrum from preschool to primary and then to secondary. I, I, I was I was I just left my role as the principal, so I know what I'm talking about. So, but why I tell myself first of all is that there must be a way for this child to learn. And I think it's high time teachers stop thinking I can do it on my own. You need collaboration. Collaboration in the sense of you and your supervisor, you and your head teacher, you and the parents, you and the students. Because if you're giving a student help and the student is not appreciating your help. They are just clashing symbols. They're just like a clashing symbol. You're not doing anything. So you need to get to that point where all these stakeholders are involved in that child's life. Most times, the support a child needs is not only from the teacher. If you can be about this child, all successes of all in the world, 
around the world, you will discover that the success started when they started collaborating with the family, they started collaborating with the, with the head teacher or whoever is their supervisor before even collaborating with that child. But a lot of teachers want to do it on their own. They want to have personalized class with this child. It's a good thing to do that, but you need to get the buy-in of all those involved first of all, so that the child will feel loved and we know that everybody is concerned about that child. Then you need to ask yourself, what does this child enjoy doing? I had a, an autistic child who even had challenges with, you know, um, what, what you call motor skills. She couldn't climb stairs, she couldn't hold pen properly, and he was in primary three already, right? But I looked for his strength. Ask yourself, what is the strength of that child, first of all? He was struggling with reading, he was struggling with a lot of things, but guess what? He had a photographic memory. He can spell all the names of everybody in the class, no matter how long your name is, you understand. He can, he can cram mathematical equations and mathematical um, 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 formulas before anybody in the class. That was his strength. And so do you know what I did? I started turning his learning material into pictures and into words that he can see and cram. It can be as simple as that. And he did the magic. Till today, he's still my friend. He's in secondary school now. And he invited me for his live performance at Muson Center. And I was so impressed. Because of his photographic, I advised his mom, please, Compose, can, can cram all those musical symbols at a glance and compose a song. Uh, and, last, and last year, she sent me a message telling me thank you and invited me to his first musical concert at Muson. So, but it took me time. I, I was drained. I felt drained when I first started with him. But I told myself, I can't do this alone. Sometimes you even need to collaborate with your colleagues at work. I can't do this alone. And I brought in all the parties involved and I started seeing results. And then we need to also get to the point where we tell parents that learning is not magic. Some children will learn slowly. My younger brother is a typical example. When he was in primary school, he was always coming last. By the time my younger brother entered secondary school, he became the best. He had A1 in further math. And right now he's a bookworm in our house. My brother can stay for hours reading. So sometimes it looks like you're not, some, what you're doing for that child is not working. But trust me, in five, six years' time, those little seeds you've sown in that child's life will become fruitful. So don't just keep at it. Don't give up. And then if it's about technology, utilize various tests. You know the beauty about technology? You can test a variety of tools on the child. I can't tell you this is the best technological tool. I can't tell you, oh, use uh, Nearpod. I can't tell you, oh, use Edvest. I can't tell you that. No. You need to look and test it on the child. Until, until you see what suits that child. For example, you know what I was using to teach him? I was using cartoons to teach Terence, Ziggy and Shaku. He loved Ziggy and Shaku. I don't know if people know that very funny cartoon. I don't even know what, what he loves about that cartoon, a mermaid and a shark. So what I do with him then is if I want him to concentrate, I'll say, okay, we're going to watch Ziggy and Shaku. Immediately after five minutes of playing, his head comes down. So it takes a lot of experimentation. It, it, it's going to cost you a lot. And I, I, I'm, I'm really pleading with schools to reduce class sizes, especially private schools, because when the class sizes are reduced, it gives these teachers, it gives teachers the opportunity to meet the personal needs of these children. Because let me be honest with you, it is not always easy. Let me tell you the mistake I made with that particular child when he was in my class. Because I was focusing on him, I left my high flyers. It was at the end of the term, I saw what I had done because I had a large class size then. You understand? So it's all about, it, it takes a lot, but for me, I felt fulfilled that at least I, could, I was able to reach one child. So you can tell yourself, okay, one child at a day. When you leave, the next teacher that takes over that child will continue from where you stopped. If all of us collaborate and we have the same mindset about these children, I tell you, by the time they move on to the next class, you see a little change, celebrate that little milestone, that progress is made. The child moves to the next class, celebrate the milestone made, and on and on and on, and the child is becoming better. I have even suggested sometimes that the child shouldn't do all subjects. It's not compulsory that children should do all the 16 subjects, 18 subjects, people are jam-packing on their heads. 
you could tell the parents, please, I'm going to take your child off so, so, so subject. We're going to focus on only the four core areas in primary school until we see some improvements. And the child will have a special um, um, results or result package at that point. And people are so bothered. Ah, they will write um, exam, WAEC, JAM. Is that how they will treat them? Well, for your, for your information, WAEC now has special exam for special students, students who have been acclaimed or certified that they have learning challenges and they have um, disabilities. And a lot of examination bodies are beginning to come up with ideas on how to differentiate exams for such children. You know, and then if you can't do it, please get professional help. We have special needs educators and individualized education planners who can do what you feel or you feel stressed to do. But the first thing is get the buying of the parents and your administrators. Thank you very much. I hope that answers your question. So, Thank you once again, Ms. Okore. So I can still see um, at Danica's hands up. Would you like to say something? Do you have a question before I hand over to John, my colleague, John? Adenike, please do you have a question. Okay, so before I step out, I'd like to say thank you once again, Ms. Okore. Um, I would also like to encourage our ed teachers and teachers who are here. We all know what we're getting from these sessions. So we are expected, it is, it is, I think it will be right for us as teachers and also ed teachers to bring in our teachers so that we don't be the only one gaining from these sessions. So as an ed, as an ed teacher, if you bring in your teacher, she he or she will be able to implement whatever they are learning from these sessions in their classroom as well. So um, I think that is the only encouragement I have for you guys before I step out for John to take over. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining in. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ovigwe, for standing in for me. Uh, I sincerely appreciate it. Um, excellent presentation, Mrs. Okore. Uh, apologies, I, I could not host the session with you as um, earlier planned. Something came up urgently and my colleague uh, to stand in for me. I, I joined in when, when you were talking about uh, mastery and I must say that your, your thoughts are quite very unique. And I believe that um, people like you are uh, the kinds of people we need in our sector so that we can uh, properly um, educate uh, or, or let me say reorientate our educators to see things from a different perspective. I like your line of thought and I must really commend you for that excellent presentation, Madam. Once again, well done to you. Um, so I know you wanted to play a video. I don't know, have you by chance played the video? Mm, no, I haven't, I haven't. I don't think I would have time for that, but um, I, would, um, I would share the link with us and then on our on, or LinkedIn, you could just, go to the Edvest page and view the, the video. It's uh, Edvest Catalyst is an international conference that takes place um, every year. And this year is going to be very exciting because we're having international speakers coming up from various parts of the world and um, educators. It's a forum where you can network with edtech people, educators from all over the world and several other participants. And it's totally free. It's a two-day program. The yeah. first day is um, on a Friday, on the first Friday of June. And then the second day is a Saturday. Friday is virtual, it will be virtually done. So we can all join online. And then the second day is um, going to be physical at the podium, Ikeja. So if you would like to participate, all you just have to do is to um, click on the link and then you're good to go. I'm trying to see if I can share the link if I go, but if not, I would like us to please visit our Edvest page. You can also go to www.edvestcatalysts.com and then you will see um, all that you need to learn about the Edvest Catalyst and then how you can register as well. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I will also I will check your social media pages and LinkedIn page to get the creatives and also okay. share on, on our online community. The right, attendance is so, is, is so surprising. I must say this is the least we've had in a long time. And I know that we're going to probably take a survey to know why this attendance is, um, is very low. Please do not be discouraged. We will upload the video no, to, 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 to our YouTube page and uh, we'll ensure we promote for more people to, to watch. And like you said, uh, I see that you are very big on collaboration. So um, we'll also go to your YouTube page and whatever contents that we, we see, they will share with our online community. So we actually have a, a Telegram group that have educators school aides, classroom teachers, school owners on that platform. So we'll share yeah. your content on that page. Just the goal is that the child is impacted. Learning outcomes uh, yeah. are improved. That is the goal. So we are not competing anyway. Thank you so much once again, Mrs. Okori. I, I can thank only you. say thank you to you. So I will communicate with you after this call. So uh, so while Mrs. Okori leaves, uh, I would love to have a very brief chat with the rest of us. Um, please do not leave, please. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Hello. Um, good, e good evening, everybody. If you can hear me, please, can you just type yes in the chat box if you can hear me? Uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. Please, I'm actually, um, I'm doing this because 